my mom was very strict you know you know she would always push us and encourage us to be our best not only in the deen and also in school mm -hmm. but an extra uh, focus on the deen and the quran yani if you came into my house everyone knows this the second you walk into my house the first thing that's going to hit your ears is the words of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the quran whether it was Sheikh Sudais at the time, whether it was Sheikh Shuraim, whether it was Sheikh Khalil Husari, yani it was it was a different environment. Your mother helped you to memorize the Quran and also as well, you know, where you were little, she wasn't putting music around and the likes of it. She understood that she needed you were an amana to her. And that comes to mind to say that you know, your unborn children have the right upon the kind of woman you're going to get married. Exactly. So I think, you know, when brothers look for, you know, women to get married to, they need to also be thinking, well, do I want this woman to mother my kid? I think it's quite important. You have to ask yourself, what is the purpose? Why are you doing this? You know, in our cultures today, it's do, 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 do this. You have to do this. Don't do this. The why is not. No, but the why is not there. So what happens to the kid? Friends are very important. It's the it's the make it or break it. It's the deal breaker. Absolutely. Who your friends are will impact you gravely. What they are, you will become. That is one thing I will promise you. Assalamu alaikum Habibi. How are you? Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good to see you, Ahmed. I'm so excited to see you, Habibi. Alhamdulillah, wallah, it's an honor to see you in the best place in the world. Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah. Subhanallah, we're in the beautiful city of Medina, Munawwara. And uh, since I've been here, the feeling has been amazing. And uh, I don't want to go back, but you know, we have to go back. <laughs> yeah, alhamdulillah, same here. You know, I've been here for a couple of months now and I cannot explain the feeling and the emotions that come with living in the city. That's well. It's it's unmatched. Unmatched. Amazing. Mashallah. You know, we've been speaking, I think, for the past two years now. How we've then. never ever met us until now in this blessed city. <laughs> you know, and you know, with social media and technology, yeah. There's a negative side to it. There's a negative side to Absolutely. it. And there's a positive side to it. Absolutely. One of the positive sides is meeting uh your brothers uh, in the da'wah uh who are spreading this deen, who are spreading Islam. And well, it's just so beautiful, you know. Right. You might be speaking to someone for ten to fifteen years, and you never met them, sure. which is absolutely, uh, you know, amazing. May Allah make it easy for us. You know, you just made me remember a verse in the Quran where Allah was say, Allah is saying, you know, you're the best of this nation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, as um, Abu Huraira said, "Khairu nas nas." The best of men are indeed men. But this khairiya has a, you know, condition is that you must be able to forbid what is wrong and encourage what exactly. is good. Exactly. So it's always hard to, you know, felt when you see brothers who are doing their best to call people to, you know, to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, spread as much goodness out there, despite the kind of society we live in today. Alhamdulillah. khair, barakallahu feek. And um, let's start with your journey with the Quran. I've seen, mashallah, first of all, I came, I first came across your clip 2018. When it became so popular after your uh, recitation in Dubai, I think the the Quran competition that happened then, yeah. and I was like, "What's a Somali brother, mashallah?" <laughs> <laughs> it was really amazing. I was quite intrigued by how you know you achieved that status, and at this moment, how you've been able to you know memorize the Quran. And I always you know uh, understand the fact that it goes back to your childhood. It goes back to how you were brought up by your parents. So talk to me about your early days. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Amma ba'd. When it came to my early days, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with two amazing parents, uh, especially a devoted mother, uh, a devoted mother to the path of the Quran and the deen. My mom was very strict, you know, you know, she would always push us and encourage us to be our best, not only in the deen and also in school, mm -hmm. but an extra uh, focus on the deen and the Quran. Yani, if you came into my house, everyone knows this. The second you walk into my house, the first thing that's going to hit your ears is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran. Whether it was Sheikh Sudais at the time, whether it was Sheikh Shuraim, whether it was Sheikh Khalil Husari, yani, it was, it was a different environment. Whereas... Subhanallah, other families, you might walk in, you might hear Somali music or even American music, the pop culture, or 
you know, just different type of, uh, yani, fawahish and stuff going on in the houses. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with uh, a mother who really, who really put, you know, a lot of time into the deen. May Allah bless her. I mean, you know. uh, so yeah, that's where my early days started with, uh, from just listening to the Quran. I remember before reading and writing the Arabic language, which is the first thing that we start with when we're about five years old, learning how to read and write the Arabic language. Alhamdulillah, I already had two jizzes memorized just by listening. Because I always tell people this, if you're struggling with the Quran, just listen to it. Keep listening, keep listening to it. Keep listening to the Quran. Just, just look at anyone else. Look at when you go to school, when you go, to the, to, when you go out there in society, just look at people. Yeah, and a lot of them, they listen to music and they can read to you all the lyrics. No, I don't know anyone who goes to a lyric for a song and, uh, and you memorize that Quran. No, it's all from listening. So why can't you do that for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And two of those things cannot enter one, one's heart, music and Quran. They cannot. You can only choose one, uh, which is the Quran, that, like Ibn al-Qayyim said. So my early days uh, really involved uh, listening to the Quran imitating many reciters at the age of four, at the age of three. I was listening to the Quran, trying to imitate them, even though I didn't know the Tajweed rules. You know, I might have been making mistakes, but Alhamdulillah, يعني, being part of a good environment is very crucial for someone's Quran journey. After that, you know, when I was around five, five and a half, I enrolled in a madrasa, and within two years, I learned how to read and write the Arabic language, which is the first step we do in our culture. I don't know maybe if it's different in other cultures, but the first thing that we do in my culture is you learn how to read and write the Arabic language. And there's so many students that come to me sometimes and they want to learn the Quran, but they don't know how to read and write the Arabic language. You know, and they might feel like it's embarrassing. No, it's not embarrassing. You have, to, everything has steps in life, whether it's, you know, medicine, whether it's uh, computer science, anything in life, business, everything has steps. You got to build your foundation first. The foundation when it comes to learning the Quran is knowing how to read, at least read the Arabic language. Maybe writing is different, but learning how to read and write the Arabic language is the number one thing we do uh, when it comes to our, our culture. Mashallah. So Alhamdulillah, it took me about two years and you know I knew how to read the Arabic language fluently. And the ajib thing with the Arabic language is Yani, right now, if you go back to where I grew up in Minnesota, uh, stay in America, if you, you know, if you speak to any kid and you bring them and you ask them to read for you the Arabic language, they can read it fluently. But if you ask them the meaning, they don't know the meaning, but they know how to read it sometimes even better than a native speaker of the language, think an Arabic speaker. Every way in the, you know, that people understand how they know how to yeah, Arabic yeah. very well, Good. clearly. Well, when it comes to the meaning, it could yeah. find it very difficult. Like, subhanAllah. I, in my university class, a couple, like last week, a couple mm -hmm. of days ago, uh, one African brother was yeah. reading the, I think he was from Senegal. He was reading the Arabic uh, text and subhanAllah, his makharj al huruf how he was pronouncing the letters, uh, the way he was emphasizing uh, al huruf some of the letters. The teacher was amazed. He was like, look at how someone that's not even Arab is reading the Arabic language. And some of you guys who is actually Arab, born Arab who only speaks Arabic struggles to sometimes read the Arabic language and it shows you that the Quran is for everyone. The Quran is for everyone. Yani it's not for a certain group of people. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set down this Quran for everyone to be able to memorize, to contemplate, to act upon it. So it's our daily life. It's our daily constitution. It's what we follow. So Alhamdulillah, that was what I focused on uh, first which was reading and writing the Arabic language. Alhamdulillah, after I was done with that, khawas, you know, I started from Surah Al-Nas to the Surah Al-Falaq. And then... Uh, was this in in, uh, in Somali or in the in Minnesota? No, no, no. This was all Minnesota. Minnesota? Minnesota. The first time I went to Somalia was 2013. And by then, I already memorized the Quran. Yeah, people have this notion that if you're in America, you can't even memorize the Quran. No, subhanAllah. The hajib thing, and I don't like to uh, boast only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We only seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. But subhanAllah, what I found very, very ajib and very, yeah, I, like, it amazed me and fascinated me was I was in class in the beginning of last semester in the Jama'a Islamiyah. And the Sheikh came in. He was the mudarris for the Quran. 
and he was asking people, how much did you memorize from the Quran Kareem? How much did you memorize from the Quran Kareem? So he started from the, the front all the way to the back. He asked everyone. And the two countries that had the Quran memorized was me as an American and two brothers that were Russian, from Russia. The rest of the class, يعني, some of them had obviously 25 just memorized, 20 just memorized, and it just يعني, it hit me more. It hit me more like, subhanAllah, look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, even though you were born in an environment that is not really uh, uh, Islam likable or it's not really, you know, revolved around Islam. Mm -hmm. It is a based Christian uh, country or even maybe a Jew country. And it was, it just amazed me, subhanAllah. So this Quran is for everyone. And I don't believe you should restrict yourself. You can memorize the Quran in Antarctica. You can memorize the Quran in Russia, Brazil. You will find for father everywhere. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said in his Quran, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr. We have sent down the remembrance, which is the Quran. Wa inna lahu lahafidun. And we will be the ones that protect it. Look at it. 1,400 years and nothing was changed from the Quran. No word, nothing. Not a single word, not a single ayah. It is the same. It's exactly the same as the day he came down. And how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve the Quran? He preserved it through a chain of narr uh, narration from Qurra. Sorry, from the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, all the way to our ulama today. Each person, each qari that you go to has something called a sanad. A chain of narration that goes from him to his teacher to the, uh, to his chef's teacher all the way to the Prophet ﷺ, and he was preserved like that. Whether you're in Russia, you'll find a, a brother in Russia with an ijaza, a brother in Brazil with an ijaza, someone in Argentina, someone in Yani. Sometimes I meet so many Muslim brothers from places where I never even heard of before, and it just shows you how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He was truthful when He said this Islam will spread and this my Quran will spread, mm. and today we see that is the case. So Alhamdulillah, uh, I memorized the Quran from Surah Al-Nas all the way to Falsurna al Qawm Al-Kafirin, the end of Surah Al-Baqarah in Minnesota. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, that's really amazing because um, when you speak about the fact that your mother helped you to memorize the Quran and also as well, you know, where you were little, she wasn't putting music around and the likes of it. She understood that she needed, you were an amana to her. And that comes to mind to say that you know, your unborn children have the right upon the kind of woman you're going to get married. Exactly. So I think, you know, when, when brothers look for, you know, women to get married to, they need to also be thinking, well, do I want this woman to mother my kids? I think it's quite important because the problem is that we don't think about the future. We just think about the now and ourselves and ourselves and likes of it. You know, when I was little, my mom would tell me to go to Islamia yeah, and she would be the dead now out of me. <laughs> She would beat me a like lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, in my in my room, right, there was this box, right? So anytime she asked me to go to Islam, yeah, I don't go. I go hide in the box. So the box is so big to take <laughs> to take me in. But subhanAllah, uh, you know, I, I got to study Islamic theology based on her advice and I wouldn't have wished to study anything else than what I've studied at the moment, subhanAllah. So I think it's quite important. And may Allah subhanAllah bless Thank your you. mother, bless our mothers, mashallah. Mm -hmm. Tell me, you know, when it comes to the Quran, I've had conversations with a lot of young people. You know, uh, why don't you read the Quran? Some people were like, hey, we don't understand the meaning, number one. Number two, we don't even know what we are saying. And that even comes to the fact that when they even make their salah, you find out that they are praying, but don't even understand exactly what they are praying, you know, what they are saying likes of it. And one of the ways before I began to learn Arabic that I got so uh, drawn to the Quran was when I began to contemplate on the meaning of what I am saying in my salah. So each verse I'm going to recite, like when Asr now, okay, this is what it means again, kaza, 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 and likes of it. So it helps me, you know, bring myself closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Allah is trying to say to me. Because I think the main aim of the Quran is for us to do tadabbur. And as we know, it's from the Arabic word, uh, dubur, right? Am I right? Yes. You speak more Arabic than me. Yeah. And that means like the back end for you to get to understand the, the, you the know, deep, exactly the deepness of it. So a lot of people just read on the surface level. But when you hear what Allah says on certain verses, you feel as if, as if as, you know, subhanAllah, Allah is communicating with you. And subhanAllah. You know, what, what do you have to say about that? Well, I, you know, a culture that we've created today, mm -hmm. which I am against, is that when the child, or however, yani how old the person is, 
before you learn or you start memorizing the Quran, you have to ask yourself, what is the purpose? Why are you doing this? You know, in our cultures today, is do, 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 do. Do this. You have to do this. Don't do this. The why is not. No, but the why is not there. So what happens to the kid? Or, or, or this, uh, the, the youth or uh, this certain individual mm -hmm. that has grown up by just hearing commands and he doesn't understand why he's doing it. What happens to that person is sometimes it works. And a lot of times we see that it works. But sometimes you see that this person, it creates a certain resentment within him. Because he doesn't know. For example, the hijab. If we taught our daughters, this is the beauty of the hijab. This is why the hijab... It, it's there to protect you. It's a, if we taught them the reasoning behind it, then the person will always stick to it. Alhamdulillah, one really uh, good trait my mom had is every single day on the ride to Duxi or the Hiv school and the ride back from the madrasa, she would always give us uh, khatiras, talks. She would tell us, this is why you're learning the Quran. This is why you're Muslim. This is the izza. This is the honor that comes with memorizing the Quran. She would explain to us the why part. The why is very important. And this is why I try, yani, I, I try to incorporate this with my students too. Because I've seen many, many instances and many times where people, they just don't know why they memorize the Quran. So many kids come to me. Okay, why you memorize the Quran? Do you know why? No, my mom told me. My dad told me I was forced today. But if you tell them what the reward will be in Yom Al-Qiyamah, what the reward will be in this world, the person will take it more seriously. So back in the day, the Salaf, before they even memorize anything, before they learn anything, almost two years, three years, one year, it's just about akhlaq. It's about purpose. They learn, they learn uh, akhlaq before they learn aid. SubhanAllah. That's how it was before. But now today you have people, SubhanAllah. You know how many reciters that I know that are, Fabulous. When you listen to this person, subhanAllah, you're going to think you're listening to Shaykh Khalil al Musari or Shaykh Minshawi. But their akhlaq is not there. Love. Their akhlaq is not there. Why? Because he was forced to do this to begin with. I know some reciters that said, I didn't want this status. I didn't want to be here. And then you have people today that would give $1 million, all their wealth, just to memorize a portion of the Quran. Not all of it, just a portion of the Quran. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. So, what I, I mean, before someone memorizes the Quran, I would like to tell them that this Quran is a responsibility. It is a burden. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He describes the Quran, He describes it as qawlan faqila. Do you know who the first person is that will be uh, thrown into hellfire? Yeah, honey, pee. This is the hadith that scares me the most. SubhanAllah. This is before Fir'aun. This is before Abu Jahl. The people, someone that said, Ana rabbukum al -a'la. I am your exalted. God, I am your exalted Lord. You know who will be thrown into hellfire before that person? It is someone who memorizes the Quran, someone who has ilm, a scholar of this deen. Why? Because nifaq is worse than kuf. Nifaq is worse than kuf. At least this person, he showed the people what's apparent in him. Like the worst person is the person who is munafiq. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي دَرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنْ النَّارِ Another qira'a, دَرَكِ الْأَسْفَلِ The lowest depths of hellfire will be the munafiqun. Even lower than the kuffar. So it is very, very important to be truthful to yourself. To be honest with yourself when you're memorizing the Qur'an. This is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should have good intention. Ikhlas, niya, this world will end. This world will end. One day you'll be six feet under the ground. So, and this Quran is a responsibility. If it's given to you, yes, you're, you're from Bani Adam. You're, you're from the children of Adam. You're going to make mistakes. But you have to be a good example for others. You have to, I know you have to set a good example for the people younger than you, for the people older than you. You are an ambassador now. For the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. You are the best of ambassadors. Being the ambassador for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better than being an ambassador for any country in this world. So what I'd like to say to people is learn the purpose before you do anything. Purifying your heart. Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا He, indeed, the person who purifies his soul and his heart is successful. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ We see this many times. 
many times in the Quran. So looking at our hearts and purifying our souls before we seek knowledge, it is very important and is a and it is a crucial part in studying the deen. And it's something that I have learned yani, later into studying the Quran and le learning the deen. It is very important to purify our hearts. Once you pur purify yourself, and you have to consistently do this. It's not one time. It's not one day. Alhamdulillah, my iman's high. And iman is the way I'm close. Iman goes up and it goes down. But it is constantly battling your nafs, telling yourself to do what is right, and telling those uh, who are uh, yani, lower than you in the ilm and above you in the ilm what is right. Like you said in the beginning, يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنَهُونَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ So purpose is very important. SubhanAllah, you know, I let's go some Muslims right now because unfortunately we live in a society where a lot of people with ill knowledge lack a clock. They like the, the manners and dealing with people, how they address people and, and it becomes a problem because it's a big problem the Ummah because those people who want to learn the deen, when they prefer their own akhlaq, and then they see you, mashallah, you've memorized the Quran, mashallah, you're a sheikh and everything, and your akhlaq is not reflecting the true meaning of Islam, it drives them away from Islam. Exactly. And you know, subhanAllah, I've seen a lot of people who give talks today. And when you spend a day or two with them, you travel with them, have conversations, you realize that you don't want to be these people. And I'll tell you a story. I, when I was done with university, I studied Sharia. And, you know, I was giving talks and everything. But I began to travel with different mashayas, you know. Oh, here, yeah, will uh, this happen, mashallah. And at a point, I was like, as I was young, I was like, is this how these people behave? I don't want to be like that. And I took the path of media. And I like, see, I'm just going to be here. Because, you see, the attitude of one person then had an impact on my decision. Why? Because... And that's what they say, never, you never get to meet your heroes, right? Because sometimes, subhanAllah, lack of akhlaq takes so many people out of the fold of the deen. Large, true. And, you know, because people look up to you, people respect you, but you don't have the manners, you don't keep to your, you know, you don't, you're, you're just not the reflection of the deen. So when it comes to ikhlas, I think it's very important for people to know the why, why are they doing something, right? And the hadith he brought, the hadith, I think this is the habit that had the hadith of, uh, of Abu Huraira where he said, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and he fainted, right? And he said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and then he fainted again. And said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and then he fainted again. And he talk, spoke about the three people that will be dragged to Jannah, the Jahannam with their faith. SubhanAllah. And among them, SubhanAllah, is the person, you know, Allah asks, we give you Quran, we give you knowledge and everything, what did you do with it? And I, I, taught, I taught the people, you know, I taught the people, mashallah. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will say, Kazab, do you like Imagine Allah Jalla al Malik telling you that you've lied. It's very, it's very, subhanAllah. It's one of the saddest, uh, yani, mawqifs and positions that someone can be in. Imagine all your amal, something you've been doing for such a long time, in a mere instant, in one second, haba and manthura, it goes away like dust. Everything is gone, and you're dragged in front of everyone to hellfire. Just ask because you didn't work on your intent. Intentions is very important, and it's like what you said. Sometimes I would travel with people. Sometimes ulama, I would get both both sides, positive sides of ulama that have mind blown me. Their ibadah, their etiquettes, the way they deal with people, their tawadu, their humbleness, yani the way, their their kindness. And I've seen the other side where uh, some people were taken away by arrogance, the way they treat people, the disrespect, the gossip, the the self-interest and negative interests that sometimes they might have and they might harbor in their heart, the ill intentions, the grudges that they hold for their Muslim brothers and sisters. Yani, I've seen all of that and it, and it made me think. And every single time, if someone wants to ask himself, how can I purify yourself? Always go back to this hadith. Sure. I try to every single day read this hadith. Why? It reminds me there will be a day where your status will not uh, help you. Yani, your position will not help you. Your kids will not help you. Your wealth will not help you. The only thing that will help you on that day is, is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after that, what you did and what you brought forth. And what you brought forth, the condition of every ibadah, what is it? Intentions. Ikhlas. 
anything that you do just just to do it and it's not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will go like dust so it's 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 a very it's a very sad reality and if you read the seerah of the prophet والسلام, and the seerah of the sahaba and the salaf the predecessors and you see how they interacted with people and how they treated this deen how every single ayah they would they would do tadabbur of it and subhanallah it's it's astonishing on it's astonishing and we need to focus we need to focus on our hearts it's it's يعني, إذا فسدت, فسد الجسد كله. The, the heart if the heart is uh, يعني, uh, it darkens or it blackens or it is um uh, يعني, it's not the same anymore the rest of the body خلاص. خلاص. if the heart is corrupted there's nothing that you can that there's nothing that you can you know bring forth no ibadah your, your ibadah is going to be less there's going to be more tests half yeah. subhanallah you know what advice would you give parents who have kids who are into drugs at the moment into fawakish different kind of fawakish and this parent realized that they've made the mistake you know in bringing their kids up and everything well what what, what advice would you give to them well i a mentor is very good. A mentor, every single person in this world needs a mentor. No matter how old you are. Some mashaykh that are 60, 70, we have people that are mentors. They're still looking at, my sheikh was telling me, every single khutbah, he's almost 65, 67, 68, almost 70. His mom watches all of his khutbahs because he records his khutbahs and she corrects him. Nope, you made a mistake there. Someone might be hurt by what you said. Fix your, fix your tone. Fix your voice. Oh, this hadith is incorrect. It's da'if. Go back to it. He has a mentor, which is his mom. And sometimes your mentor might be your sheikh. My main mentor is my sheikh. Mm. My sheikh would correct me always. If I'm in a majlis and he hears my voice, I'm too loud, he'll pull me in a corner. He'll tell me, Ahmed, you're too loud. You know, calm down. And he, till this day, he still gives me advice. He, if he sees my social media stories, he says, okay, this is not, this is not appropriate. Delete it. What you said here is wrong. Twitter, same thing. So you need someone that's a mentor from a very, very young age. Very young age. So what I would like to say to parents is the tarbiyah starts from the house. Hmm. The tarbiyah and the and the teaching of the akhlaq, it starts from the house. It starts from the house. So you, you have to look at yourself first as a parent. You have to fix yourself first. If the father is smoking and the mom is listening to music, and, and the haram money is entering the house. How do you expect those kids to be corrected? How do you expect them to, to be on the straight path if you're not on the straight path? No. Your kids will be what you are. They are a mirror of you, Sahir. And they say, Man shabbaha abaw from Allah in Arabic language. Whoever, uh, whoever, or uh, yani is like their father, is, is not to be blamed. So it is very important that the parents, they look at themselves first. Am I my best version? Am I a good role model for my kids? But you f you'll find parents, read Qur'an, do this. But you'll never find them picking up the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Absolutely. My father, every, يعني, subhanAllah, every morning before Fajr, he's awake almost 30, 45 minutes before, praying uh, sunnah prayer, praying uh, the last third of the night. Then he recites, all, until shuruq, he recites one juice of Qur'an. When the kid sees that, he says, look at my father. You're going to feel it. guilt. They're going to like, you know, I want to be, be like my father and be righteous. Then you're going to sit down next the next day. You're going to sit next to him until Shuruq. You're going to sit with him. It all starts from the house. And the next thing is where, which type of environment you put them in. Mm -hmm. If you take them to a bad school in a bad environment, whatever you teach them at home, خلاص, it's going to be erased when they go to school. There's going to be a, a friend of, those, of, of theirs or a, a teacher of theirs that's going to erase everything that you teach them at home. خلاص, when you, it's ca it cancels out. You teach them something, they learn a bad thing at school. So you have to be careful with what type of environment you throw them in. Hmm. That's another thing. And also du'a. Make a lot of du'a for your kids. Don't make du'a against them. Always make du'a for them. Because this world, we do not guide. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides. The Prophet Ali when he is when his uncle Abu Talib died, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, say, إِنَّكَ لَا مَنْ أحبت. You do not guide who you love. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah guides who he wills. وَهُوَ أَعْلَمْ بِالْمُهْتَدِي so it's very important that we make dua. We put them in a good environment. We create a good environment for them. Don't be too strict and don't be too lenient. Be balanced.
you know, give them some freedom. Let them pay, play sports. So that, that's healthy for them. It's good for them. You know, two, three days. Uh, uh, let them sign up for a, a club where they can play uh, for soccer or basketball and take them to the gym sometimes. You know, take them to a mall sometimes. You know, give them fun time. At the same time, make sure they go to uh, a Islamic school, Quran school. Everything in life is a balance. Actually, Ibn Kathir, he mentions a very, very yani, wise statement. He says, we used to see people that their parents are, or the society is very strict on them. In the beginning, you'll find them later on, they're running away from Ali. But those who were given a little bit of freedom, not too much, but a little bit of freedom, later on, they realize that that freedom, there's nothing there. No fa'idah. Playing soccer all day, you know, gaming all day. There's no fa'idah. So later they come back to Ali because they realize there's, there's nothing there. So that's why you need to teach them from young. But parents, you know, and they have good intention. They put pressure, 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 pressure. But one day, they're going to be older. They're going to leave your house. They're going to get married. So we want to incorporate these values and morals within them by sitting down with them, talking to them, you know, asking them, how do you feel? You know, what are your goals? Speaking to them, sometimes like an adult, like a friend. Alhamdulillah, my father, he speaks to me like an adult. He always asks me, like, well, what's your business ideas? What do you think we should start together? You know, well, you wouldn't do, when do you want to get married? When I was 16, 15, he was speaking to me like this. So it's important that you befriend your children. Befriend. But don't become a dictator where they run away from you. Because eventually, how many times have I seen very strict parents and you see their kids later on doing things behind their head? How many times have you seen this? So, when they have problems, they don't even go to their parent. They go to other people that will advise them the wrong way. Oh, exactly. Or are you feeling kind of depressed? Try this. It's very important how the kid is raised from a very young age, from a very young age. And sometimes people might go like, but this, this kid was taking Duxi. He was taken uh, to Islamic school. You know, his parents he used to advise him. No, there's always a way. The way matters. It's not what you do. I can, two companies right now, they can create uh, two phones, but it's the way, what's inside this phone, the value, the quality. So the quality of the tarbiyah matters more than the quantity of the tarbiyah. So see that? The quality of the tarbiyah. But sometimes you might try everything, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has other things in plan. So you have to make dua. Sometimes your kids, your wealth and your kids are a fitna towards you. Sometimes they can be fit and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might test you. He tested Prophet Nuh with his son, who is a prophet. So, uh, duha is very important. You have to remember that nothing is in your hands. You can, you can advise, but guidance and irshad and hidayat is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands. SubhanAllah. Talk to me about how your friends have played a major role in becoming the kind of person you are. Wallahi, so I always tell people this. I had two group of friends. I had friends in school, and I had friends from Islamic school, uh, Quran, Quranic school. My heart always leaned towards those from Quran school. Why? Because Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday afternoon, Tuesday afternoons, Wednesday afternoons, I'm always with uh, these brothers. So this Sushba Saliha, these righteous friends, this righteous group, push me, they encourage me always, where other people were talking about the new album that dra dropped for music, or the new movie, or the new show, my friends would be talking about, oh, listen to this sheikh, listen to this, guy, uh, to, to this guy's voice, listen to this Qari's voice, subhanAllah, look at this sheikh, uh, how he explained this fiqh uh, chapter, look how, what hadith is talking about. Of course, we would speak about uh, things that, uh, you know, contain entertainment. But the majority of the times, it was always about the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it was really nice. And I thank my sheikh for that. My sheikh, he kept us together. He knew that out there are people that are like hyenas, that are waiting for the, for the right moment to take you into the fawahish, to take you into the darkness. But my sheikh, he created this environment, a group of friends. And he was like our, our, our father figure to us. And he's still our father figure to us. And subhanAllah, like, I always loved them more because the connection that we had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put more barakah in this friendship than this friendship. These brothers were good, but they weren't as connected to the Quran as these brothers. And so my heart always went towards the people of Quran. So Alhamdulillah, it was, it was just, I felt comfortable when I was around them. We understood each other. We had the same language. It's as if we're talking a different language. When I talk about Ghunna right now, this brother might not understand, but this brother might understand. If I talk about mistakes that are done in the Quran, we might laugh about it. And, you know, 
you know, funny moment that happened in the class, but this brother might not understand what happened in that certain moment. So having righteous friends is very, very important. It's like the Prophet ﷺ, he compared it to walking to a perfume shop, the environment, the friends, mm. walking to a perfume shop. When you walk to a perfume shop, it smells so good. That Those are righteous friends. But imagine walking to a butcher or a malhama where, you know, they're cutting meat all day and it smells really bad. If you stay there for a couple minutes, you're going to start smelling like it too. Sure. So you are what your friends are. So you are on the path of your friends. What they are on, you're going to be on. And a lot of people tell me, no, I'm the group leader. I'm this. No. The evil is, is going to win at the end of the day. Imagine you're one person. I understand if this four of you guys are good and one person is bad, that person is going to join you guys. Mm -hmm. But imagine it's one person that's good and you have four people that are bad. Uh, one, one person that is good and four people that are bad. At the end of the day, that brother is going to take the, the wrong course. And I've seen this all the time, all the time. It either goes two ways. This brother, he cuts them off and says, you know, I, I don't want this lifestyle anymore. I want to stay firm on the deed. Or he becomes like them. There's no, there's no two other choices. Anything that Prophet Ali Sallallahu has explained in the Hadith and has explained from the Quran, it is always true. We always see it becoming true. Anything the Prophet Ali Sallallahu has talked about and has warned us against and has advised us is always the truth, and we should always stick and adhere to those values and those morals that the Prophet Ali Sallallahu taught us. I mean, how do you cut off toxic friends? Wallahi, it's easier said than done. It's the most difficult thing. And it is something that has tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something that comes from above. You can't do it. Sometimes you're not able to do it. You knew this person for 10 years. Imagine. I can't say to someone, oh, cut this person off because it's like, oh, it's 10 years. So the only thing you could do is make dua. And sometimes when you become an adult, you have to look at the positives and negatives. Look at all your friends right now. Look at all your friends that you have right now. Enlist their positives and negatives. If the negatives outweigh the positives way more, khalas. You should cut off that person. You're an adult. Don't wait for it to be too late. Mm. And if the positive is more than the negative and he has some, some stuff, then he's a human being. He makes mistakes. And I'm not going to tell you to, to cut off someone that you've been friends with. If their positive is good and they're helping you, they're benefiting you. Had to have their benefiting you this dunya. That's good enough. At least something. But imagine you find some friends, they don't benefit you. Dunya and akhirah, nothing. So, at the end of the day, it is very difficult, but you have to uh, account yourself. You have to evaluate yourself. Every night you sit down, go like, you know, what did I do today? Who did I speak with? Well, like, friends are very important. It's the, it's the make it or break it. It's the deal breaker. Absolutely. Who your friends are will impact you gravely. What they are, you will become. That is one thing I will promise you this. I will want, I can almost swear on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this. If your friends are bad, one day you'll become like them. So here. Unless, illa man rahim Allah. Except that's why Allah has mercy. And that's why if you look at the majority of my friends, alhamdulillah, there are people who are always constantly studying the Quran, constantly listening to the Quran. Yeah, subhanAllah, from my friend group, there was no one who listened to music. No one who did drugs. Think of that sort to the point that when we, when we see it or we hear it, yeah, we feel sick one time. It's like it's like we're programmed, we're like robots. One time, Ali subhanAllah, it's because of the environment. Sure, the environment is very important. You see someone, ah, oh, Sheikh, I'm trying to remember the Quran, but his friends are playing football all day, they're going to clubs, they're going to hotels and doing madness. They're honey, and he wants to remember the Quran. The first thing before you start, thought about I'll cut off those who are harming you. And sometimes it might not be physical harm, but it might be spiritual harm, emotional harm, and mental harm. SubhanAllah. Damn. That's really amazing. Um, just before we end our conversation for today, and uh, tell me about, you read the Quran a lot, alhamdulillah, you're a hafiz of the Quran. I know a lot of verses stand out the most, right? But which will you say stand out the most, the most for you personally? It's a hard question. One ayah that stands out to me the most is the first one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ Or تَرْجِعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ Fear the day, remember the day that you will return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This world will finish. 
Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is promising. Remember that they fear that day. ثُمَّ تُوَفَّى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ Only what you have brought forth for yourself will benefit you that day and no one will be oppressed that day. Everyone will get what they worked for. And who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees befitting to enter Jannah will only enter Jannah. And whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees befitting to be punished and enters hell, that is what will, that will be the case. And another ayah that's similar to it, Ya أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ تَقُوا رَبَّكُمْ O you people, Fear your Lord. Have taqwa. Have piety of your Lord. Waqshaw yawman. Fear a day. La yajzi walidun awaladihi wa la mawludun huwa jazin awaladihi A day where a father or a parent or a mother cannot help their child. And a day a child cannot help their parents. Only The only people that will be able to help each other are the families that were built upon taqwa. Hmm. Families that had Quran amongst them. Kids that were kafal. And do you know what happens to those who memorize the Qur'an? Where everyone else is running around. Where everyone else will be drowning in their sweat on this very hot day. On this very long day that is equal to almost a thousand years. And in the way it feels almost, it feels like a thousand years. Do you know who will be sitting on thrones under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The people of Qur'an. They will be crowned. The parent will be crowned. The parent might not know the Qur'an. The, the father or the mom, they might not know the Qur'an. But because they have someone in their family, their offspring knows the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor them that day. SubhanAllah. Will honor them that day. So I look at this ayah, I go like a day where the kid or the, the offspring cannot benefit the parent and the parent cannot benefit the offspring. I look at the people of the Qur'an. Their situation is different. This ayah doesn't rely to them. On that day, the Qur'an will help both sides. They will be honored that day. So I urge people, I urge every family, every community, every society to stick to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because whoever honors the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will never humiliate them. Never will humiliate them. How do you get to the highest level of Jannah? Through the stairs of how much Qur'an you know. Each step, maybe each verse or each just Allah alam, how it will be. But subhanallah, this Qur'an is barakah. This Qur'an is blessed. And my shaykh always tell me, he said, Ahmed, don't rely on anything else. This book that you have will benefit you. The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have in your heart will benefit you. Don't look for anything else to replace it. How many times have I seen people who left teaching the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who have left the da'wah, who, uh, who have left the Qur'an, and they try to go into corporate world maybe. They try to go into like business. They gave more time to business. Each time they came back and they were like, SubhanAllah, the other side is dark. Don't go there. I have, you know, I felt so depressed, so sad on the other side. It is way better and more bright on this side. And in America right now, you'll find mashayikh, scholars, teachers. They might not be the richest, but they are rich in the heart. They are rich in the heart. The person who runs after this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know what he will do? Like the Prophet ﷺ told us, he will put faqr between here. He put, you know, poverty in between his eyes. Why? He might be rich sometimes. He might have he might have wealth, but his heart is not rich. Therefore, he will never be content. That's why you find a lot of celebrities, a lot of uh, rich people, a lot of wealthy people, presidents, politicians. They're not happy. On the mother, on the outside, they seem happy, but they're not truly happy. But you'll find people. The Sahabs look at them, how happy they were, how content they were, and they weren't the richest. The Prophet Ali Zatsalam, yani there will be times she would tie himself with a belt because of how hungry he was. But still he was content, he was happy. I much happier than anyone. So you know, richness is not through what you get or the wealth that you have. Richness is through the heart and being content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. There's so many people today, el elders that pray in the Haram. Every single day they pray in Masnabui, the Haram Mecca. They, they might not know what will come to them tomorrow. They don't know what money is going to come to them tomorrow. They have nothing in their bank accounts. Tawakkul ala Allah. So, but then throughout the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them rizq, gives them food, gives them clothing, gives them shelter. Subhanallah. This Quran is barakah. This Quran is barakah. This Quran and this deen is your savior on the day of judgment. Nothing else will save you. Nothing, nothing else will save you. Not in the qabr. The only thing that goes with you in the grave is your actions. Your amal. So imagine someone who had the Qur'an in the heart. Do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will humiliate that person? No. 
Allah says, ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَ الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ اسْتَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا Those who I have chosen for my servants, the chosen ones, whom Ahlullah, they are the chosen people of Allah, they are the family of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have a father. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have a mother. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have kids. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفْرٌ أَحَدٍ But do you know the group that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for himself as a family are the people of the Qur'an. And may Allah make us an Islam people of the Qur'an. Amin, ya Rabbi. Ah, Ahmed, my final question. Yeah. Tell me, what are you most grateful for? Allah, yeah. the most, the, يعني, the thing I am most grateful for is this deed, Islam. Islam. Because I see, I, I live with kuffar, I live with Christians, I live with Jews, I live with atheists. I see how their life is. And I see our lives completely different. We are happy, the Muslims are. Even though sometimes we might be sad, we might not be above everyone financially. But Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with Islam. We have a purpose in life. Humans that have no purpose in life are like cattle. They are like cattle, but sometimes they're worse. Even the cattle has purpose. Allah says, وَإِن مِشِيْ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِي The cattle is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The lion is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The plants are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So having Islam brings purpose to our life. It brings a constitution to our life. We may not be perfect, but Islam is perfect. And it has given us rights and morals and values that you cannot find anywhere else. And the second thing is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me so much in this world. And I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me even more in the akhirah and gives me more in this dunya shelf. Because so far I have seen that the Qur'an is Mubarak. SubhanAllah, I got married a couple months ago. What if I told you every single dime that, that went into that wedding was all from the Qur'an? I have never worked a day in my life. Corporate world or factory or warehouse or business. Everything was from the ayat of the Qur'an and Kareem that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. So... May Allah bless your friend. And subhanAllah, it reminds me of a story that I always like to mention. You know, the famous Somali Sheikh, Qari Sheikh Abdul Shir Ali Sufi. Yeah. What happened to him was, when he was young, you know, he was very, you know, uh, hyped to learn the English language and math. So one day, his father, who was a very great Sheikh himself, a very great Quranic scholar, uh, one of the great uh, Quranic scholars of all time in Somalia, he saw his son, Sheikh Abdul Shir Ali Sufi, walking with books in his hand. And he's wearing, he even changed his clothing. He has now pants and a shirt. He told him, where are you going? He said, father, you know, I'm going to uh, school to learn English and science and math. He said, okay, look around, look around you right now. They were at the masjid. He said, look around this masjid. Do you see all these stores and all these houses? Who owns them? He said, father, you own them. I said, how did I get them? He said, he said, you got it too, يعني, with the Qur'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You got it through the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, have I ever worked in business? Have I ever worked in, uh, uh, have I ever learned anything about business or math or science? Do I even know a word in English? He said, he said no. But he said, I got all this with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored me in this world with the Qur'an. So he said, remember my son, one day you will have emirs, kings, picking up your shoes for you. you there will be a day where... There are people of very high status will be respecting you. And subhanAllah, fast forward many years later, Sheikh Abdul Shah Sufi was leading at the uh, the main mosque in Qatar. And subhanAllah, the Amir prayed with him, or one of the princes. The Sheikh came out of Salah, he came out of the masjid, he couldn't find his shoes. Someone told him, oh, the Amir took your shoes for you when he's in the car ring. SubhanAllah. And then years later, he seen what his father speak, is speaking about. Because it is the truth. This Qur'an will honor you. I've met يعني, world leaders. I've met the president of Sudan. I met the, the, the Amir of Kuwait. All towards, uh, through the Qur'an. All through the Qur'an. It was nothing to do with politics. It was nothing to do with a uh, study in science or a breakthrough in technology. It was all because of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were honoring us through the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And يعني, I'd like to urge people to stay connected to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because not only will Allah honor you in akhirah, He will honor you in this dunya. Before you die, you will see the honor and the blessings of the Qur'an. And you, usually, people of the Qur'an, you'll never see them in poverty. That's one thing I've seen. They're always the best just people. They always have the best things. Ask anyone. They're known for this. 
But Allah subhanahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has you know raised in its status. And the more you have ikhlas, the more you're humble, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you much more. Alhamdulillah. Radama Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much for the words. Uh, first of all, this is for me, you know, I'm, I've learned a lot so far in the conversation. And I ask Allah that He perfect us and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who will, you know, the Quran will be for us and not against us. May Allah. Mama Charles Quran a Hujjatan Lena, Wala Tajal Hujjatan Hai. Amin Ya Rab. Amin Ya Rab. All right, dear viewers, Alhamdulillah, we've come to the end of this episode. Uh, if you haven't read the Quran today, you need to go read the Quran. If you don't know how to read the Quran, don't waste time. This is the perfect time for you to get someone to teach you. You just have a few days left in this world. You don't know if you're going to go back to Allah tomorrow. You don't know if you're going to go back to Allah this next minute. But the question you should ask yourself is how do you want to meet the one? that has created you and made you in the best of ways. Do you even know him? Or you're just guessing and praying because you're asked to pray? May Allah make life easy for us. Until the next episode, I'll leave you all the care of Allah. Assalamu alaikum.